Hello, my name is Jake Verma. I'm a senior consultant at the Energy Systems Catapult, and today I'm going to be talking about the open data triage process. The open data triage process we developed as part of the Energy Data Task Force, and we use the open data triage process to promote the use of open data and the publication of data in line with the UK government's strategic objectives towards a modern digitalised energy system. We use the open data triage process on our own information and we've also worked with some organisations to uh, promote their use of open data through this robust process which I'm going to be talking you through today. So a short recap on uh, what, what is the Energy Data Task Force. So uh, the Energy Data Task Force was launched in October 2018 and they delivered their recommendations in June 2019 with a report called A Strategy for a Modern Digitalised Energy System. It presented five key recommendations that will help the UK energy system drive towards its net zero carbon future. And it was commissioned by Ofgem, Innovate UK and the Department for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy. The central thesis was that in order to achieve uh, net zero carbon, that the UK energy system needs to be a modern digitalised energy system. And the Energy Data Task Force focused on a couple of different things. Um, at the bottom was data visibility, um, building on that was infrastructure and asset visibility. And what this would enable is opt operational optimization, open markets with new innovative business models um, that are carbon neutral or net zero, and that there is agile regulation uh, that can support um, emerging methods and techniques of decarbonising the UK energy system. So what were the outcomes and the goals? So filling in the gaps and maximising the value of information were the key outcomes uh, that would deliver a modern digitalised energy system. So there were five recommendations in total, um, and they were based on two principles and three building block projects. So the first principle was the digitalisation of the energy system, that there were new data needs emerging from the UK energy system that weren't currently being met, that the principles of continuous improvement that are common across the technology sector needed to be embedded within energy, and that digitalisation strategies were necessary to be produced in order to move the sector forward to that modern digitalised energy system. The principle that we'll be talking about today is the presumed open principle, the idea that data must be discoverable, searchable and understandable, that there need to be structures, interfaces and standards, and that sharing of information needs to be secure and resilient uh, to make sure that it maximises the value of it. And this is the acceptance that a lot of information does exist within energy, but that it's not being used to its fullest potential. Um, we're not going to talk about the three building block projects today, but very broadly, um, the data catalogue is being delivered by Icebreaker One, Arup and Hippo Digital. Um, the asset registration strategy is being delivered by Bayes, and uh, the digital system map is being delivered by the Energy Networks Association. So, what is presumed open? Uh, what is the principle? What does it mean in terms of uh, the UK energy system? So the presumed open principle was based on the second recommendation, maximising the value of data. Government and Ofgem should direct the sector to adopt the principle that energy system data should be presumed open using their range of existing legislative and regulatory measures as appropriate. So this is maximising access and value of information that already exists. We found during the Energy Data Task Force that uh, energy system data was extremely difficult to find, uh, to access, that there were a lot of different ways in which you could uh, prevent access, uh, particularly if you needed to, if you needed it for uh, a commercial business model, um, or, for, or if you were using it as part of an organisation that was making a profit. Not so much in academia, but still needed a lot of sort of insider information to find information uh, and to use it to its fullest extent. So what is the presumed open principle? So presumed open is the principle that data should be as open as possible. Where the most granular data cannot be entirely open, the data custodian should provide an objective justification for this. So what this does is it gives different levels as to how data can be shared practically. And this is based on the ODI's data openness spectrum. So open, data is made available for all to use, modify and distribute with no restrictions at all. Public, that data is made publicly available but with some restrictions on usage, for example, non-commercial use. 
Shared data, data is made available to a limited group of participants, possibly with some restrictions on usage. And then closed, data is only available within a single organization. What this does is it flips the, uh, flips the principle of having to justify making data open or giving data out on its head and instead justifies why data needs to be closed and what the legitimate risk factors are uh, for why you cannot make data entirely open. And what, this, what the presumed open principle does is it gives a framework and a robust methodology for how to assess what the real risks are of sharing, uh, sharing data and information that you have. So this begs the question, what is an objective justification? So as part of the Energy Data Task Force principles, we wanted to look at what are the legitimate issues that could limit openness. Can they be effectively mitigated with sensible data modifications or another method? And if not, then why not? So the five broad categories that we identified were privacy, security, negative consumer impact, commercial interest, and legislation and regulation. So privacy, the first one, data that relates to a natural person that can be identified directly from the information. This could be a name, a telephone number. It could be something like an email address, personally identifiable information, but it also could be anything that could allow the, the person to be re-identified. So it could be uh, an address, a location, a set of coordinates, um, or something that allows them to be re-identified, such as characteristics about energy demand um, or other factors that are unique to that person. Security, so data that incre creates incremental or exacerbates existing security issues which cannot be mitigated. So in some cases, for example, there may be information about assets related to a, a defence site or a site which is critical national infrastructure. In this case, the incremental risk is the key part. So I, as I'm driving along the M6, I can see uh, a grid supply point out of my window, in, in which case, if it's perfectly visible to the naked eye, for example, with power lines um, for the high voltage transmission network, then there's no incremental risk to me sharing where those asset locations are. There are already other ways in which I can access that information or, or, or know where that is. Negative consumer impact is data that's likely to drive actions, intentional or otherwise, which negatively impact the consumer. This could be through unsolicited service offerings from people, could be through advertising, or it could be that a consumer's uh, price is hiked through the exposure of certain information. Commercial interest is data that relates to the private administration of a business or data which was not collected as part of an obligation or by a regulated monopoly. So what does this mean in practice? So if you have invested private uh, capital or, uh, or invested money into uh, collecting uh, data as part of a project or as part of an activity, as part of your business, you're well within your right to may treat it as your own intellectual property and to come up with your own commercial model. However, there are some uh, regulated entities uh, within the energy system uh, that collect uh, information and data as part of a regulated uh, process. And in that case, um, it wouldn't have been originated or captured without the, uh, without the activity of, the, of that organisation. Uh, so it can therefore be uh, you know, more, more public or more open and has less commercial interest associated with it. Legislation and regulation, um, there are a couple of specific instances of these, so specific codes, uh, specific uh, practices uh, which prohibit the publication of data. Um, so in particular, there are things like the DAP framework and GDPR, um, which are covered in other areas of this, um, of the objective justification. So that's objective justification. So how do you go about applying the open data triage? And what do we mean by mitigation techniques in order to make data as open as possible? So the open data triage process very broadly is you identify a data set and this, uh, this data set could be as part of a user need or a user story that you've identified from somebody external to yourself, or it could be somebody internal to your organization. You identify the issues that are associated with that information on, on an objective basis. You would then put in place a plan to mitigate those issues and document what you've done to do so. You can then publish that documentation and that information, or if you don't plan to share that information, just the metadata associated with it. 
The key part of this is that it's open to challenge and review. So for example, if you have designated something as shared, that a user knows that that information exists, they can then challenge uh, who it is shared with and whether they can get access to it. So for example, um, if uh, a piece of data has a non-commercial clause associated with it, so it can't be used for commercial purposes, an innovator working in the energy space might be able to contact that uh, user and say, actually, it would be really beneficial if we could use this for commercial purposes because we're trying to promote a business model that moves the UK further towards net zero. So in this case, the data provider might reassess their, their, their position on that, on that non-commercial clause and may allow them to uh, use it. And in that case, they might decide that there's no reason why it needs to be shared and actually it can just be public with an attribution license. So the key part of the process is that it provides uh, a, a specific um, flow uh, from the identification of the data set to the challenge and review and an iterative process in which you can reevaluate uh, the decisions that have been made to mitigate those issues. The key part of this is that it's all well documented, that users understand what has been done to the data set um, and that what the procedures have been taking place, also to reassure them that some of the risks associated with things like re-identification um, are, are appropriately mitigated and that they're not going to be liable for uh, something happening in future. So what kind of data mitigation steps are there for, um, for, for modifying the information? So at the top here we have anonymization. So this is removing or altering identifying features. Um, we have pseudo anonymization, which is replacing the identifying features with a unique identifier that retains the reference. Now, the key thing to remember here is that whilst anonymized data is not covered under GDPR, pseudo anonymized data is still covered under GDPR. So you still need informed consent in order to share it with somebody. Now, in some cases, it might be useful to retain some of those, uh, some of the links to the identifying features. Um, in the case of working with local authorities, this is often the case where specific energy interventions need to take place. But in cases where, uh, where research has taken place, for example, where it doesn't so much matter as to what the specific identity of an asset or a person or a location is, then sometimes it can be appropriate to completely just anonymize that information. Adding noise, so combining the original data set with meaningless data can reduce the uh, impact that you have. And the important thing here is that there's still statistical um, features associated with the data set that mean that it's still useful. Delay, so this is a, a common technique for publishing particularly temporal data. Um, so delaying the publication by a day, a week, a month, even a year. In fact, our living lab data is published on a yearly basis. Um, so that some of that live data, that energy demand data that comes out of the living lab um, is, then, uh, is then a year old by the time it gets out. It's still useful for research because you can look at the specific weather patterns, but it means that it's not live information and can't be re-identified on a specific uh, basis. Uh, differential privacy is an algorithm or a model uh, which obscures the original data to limit re-identification. Um, there is uh, some emerging research on this topic, and in fact, quite a few of the tech companies like Apple use this in, uh, to protect the privacy of their uh, users uh, when they uh, use iPhones. Um, redaction, this is an easy one, removing or overwriting specific features um, if, you, if it's appropriate to do so. Aggregation is combining data to reduce the granularity of, of resolution, time, space or individuals. So this could be for a local authority aggregating up to an LSOA area. Um, this could be uh, aggregating to a day, a week, a month, um, or it could be specific arch behavioural archetypes. Um, that are consistent across individuals that, uh, that, that are still useful in themselves and it could be used for consumer segmentation. Shifting and rotating and randomization is altering the position, orientation uh, or, ident or arbitrary changes. So this could be something like uh, missing, mixing up the address details of specific participants, such that, for example, with energy demand, it's not tied to a specific address or a specific MPAN, uh, so that it's not identifiable to a specific person. 
And then normalization, modifying the data to reduce the difference between individual subjects. This could be useful if you're doing statistical analysis or looking at behavioral archetypes or something like that, as it smooths over some of those factors and makes them less unique to the, uh, to the asset, the person, for example, that you're, that you're looking at. So all in all, this is the open data triage process from end to end. So identifying the data set and then looking at the issues, the commercial assessment, the security assessment, the privacy assessment, consumer impact, the legislation and regulatory assessment, then really looking at what you can do to mitigate those issues in an informed way. So can you anonymize? Can you redact? Can you delay the publication? What sort of sensitivities do they have in relation to the issues? And then what you would do is you would allocate perhaps even multiple levels of openness for the same data set, depending on what you do to it. So for example, you might decide that an aggregated data set or a, let's say an energy demand data set could be open at a, uh, at a postcode level, that it could be open at a, a daily or weekly level, that there are no identifying features there. But that maybe you would share some of the more granular data, maybe at an individual basis for a specific area with somebody who had a robust data protection plan in place or for an academic study rather than a commercial uh, proposition. What you would then do is document all of that and along with your publication, um, you would also be open to challenge and review and have a mechanism for reviewing that process as you go along so that it can change. So this is the open data triage canvas. So this is the canvas that we use to uh, examine how open data can be. And what we're going to do now is we're going to uh, run through a specific example, which is the energy demand from smart meter. And we're going to consider a couple of different factors uh, that, that this entails in order to provide you with a worked example as to how this canvas can be used in practice. So for domestic smart meters, um, this is the energy demand. So in this case, with this data set, it contains uh, a meter point. This has been decided by the Information Commissioner's Office that a meter point or an MPAN is personal data. Um, also, the personal demand of a person um, is unique to them. And so, in fact, is an identifying feature. So in this case, what we would want to do is consider um, how we would reduce that sensitivity. On the security basis, um, there may be a significant amount of information about attack intelligence from maybe a hostile state actor um, that you could get. But in this case, we've decided that because it's only a few participants, um, their ability to influence the energy system is limited. Uh, the negative consumer impact that potentially, potentially uh, they could be targeted by a service provider it may be, in fact, that this is what we want, that we are part of a, a supplier that's looking to expand their range of services. And so in this case, it, it may be, targeting is maybe something that we do want. On the commercial interest side, the supplier may have invested in the smart meter infrastructure. And so they may be at liberty to determine how some of that information is used. Um, but obviously that's balanced with uh, the fact that the data in fact belongs to the, the, uh, the consumer themselves. Obviously on a legislation and regulation basis, there's GDPR, which is associated with personal data and that the DAP framework also provides a guideline as to how to treat um, energy demand data. So what modification techniques would we put in place? So there's a couple of different ways in which we can do this. We could modify and remove unique identifiers. So for example, names, addresses, uh, if it contained phone numbers and obviously uh, meet point numbers, uh, which we've already discussed. We can ensure patterns do not allow users to identify individuals. So this could be concatenating or aggregating into behavioral archetypes. If we were interested in specific um, energy demand profiles, then we might be able to train a differential privacy model uh, to implement um, privacy in that way. Or we could combine data to reduce the granularity either across a specific area or a specific time. Finally, there's also the option to randomize unique elements of the data. So maybe mixing up the addresses of the people in different places or what we've done in the past with the living lab data is um, uh, pseudo anonymize the something like the weather station um, to reduce the amount of re-identification risk uh, that's that is an option there. So if issues have been robustly mitigated, and this is the key point of the presumed open principle, then the data could be open if there are no significant risks associated with it. 
If the risks have been mitigated but there exists a risk of re-identification, then the data may be shared with a restricted license. If the issues are not mitigated, so there are still unique IDs that aren't removed, then shared access might be possible under strict conditions. For example, um, under the GDPR, uh, they become a data processor and they need to have informed consent from the user to use that information. So finally, how might we share this information? Um, so generally speaking, there's a couple of different ways in which you might categorize data. So live data or raw data uh, are normally shared through application protocol interfaces, um, so APIs, and they're the de facto standard for the access of live data. Um, Alexon, particularly within um, electricity, have developed and deployed successful APIs. Um, for historic data, machine-readable files um, are really important, such as CSV or JSON, and these, generally speaking, are pretty common across the sector. Uh, they exist across data portals and um, are particularly the go-to um, data type for um, publishing historic data, especially large historical data sets. And then user interfaces, including dashboards, so data portals are becoming more and more common across the energy sector. Um, so Energy Systems Catapult has one, uh, Open Energy is producing a metadata catalogue, um, Western Power Distribution, UKPN, most of the network operators have data portal now, uh, which allows them to publish information. Um, but it's, uh, they're, they're a valuable addition uh, and increase the discoverability and the accessibility of information as they can collate all of this data into one place and make it really nice and easy to find and accessible. So thank you for listening to this open data triage session. Um, if you have any further questions, you can contact me on LinkedIn or go through our website. Um, and thank you for listening.